recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the Maryland Chamber of Commerce. We are very excited to have two extremely important guests with us today and when, while we continue our COVID-19 conversations and webinars. Today, we are joined by our Maryland Comptroller, Peter, Peter Francho, as well as Andy Schoffel, the Director of the Bureau of Revenue Estimates. Of course, we have Ms. Ashley Duckman, the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, who will be joining us for the Q&A section of the conversation. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are in muted and listen-only mode. To ensure that you are muted, please make sure to look for the mic um, to make sure that it's off and you can see the symbol here on your screen. Um, please also be aware that there is a webcam that may be on and recording. And so if your webcam is on, um, just know that it might be um, included in the recording that's going to be posted online. You can always turn off your camera by clicking on the camera symbol. Um, this is an interactive conversation after we get done with the conversation and presentations from our two guests. So please add your questions to the chat section. You can click on the, the symbol that you see here on your screen and you can type those questions for our speakers. Uh, Ms. Ashley Duckman will actually be looking at those throughout the conversation and will bring them to our speakers directly um, towards the end. If we are not able to get to your question or maybe it's really specific, please go ahead and reach out to the Maryland Chamber and we will make sure that our two guests today um, receive your question. And then of course, today's webinar will be recorded as it is and added to the Maryland Chamber's newly designed COVID-19 resources page and of course, our YouTube channel. So speaking of that resources page, we are continuing to update it regularly for you. We wanna make sure that Maryland businesses has, have as much information as possible regarding state and federal um, issues at hand. Um, last couple of weeks, we've added some really great documents for you, um, brought to you by the Maryland Chamber and some of our partners, including the Renew Maryland Initiative, which is a collection of policy proposals that are going to assist Maryland in overcoming um, and rebuilding the economy. We also have our safe um, workplace best practices and baselines for reopening. Um, as we know, many counties are doing so today and certainly will be in the coming weeks and months. So please continue to check back um, as we add resources on a daily basis. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce you to um, the Maryland Comptroller, Peter Francho. Peter, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, to make your remarks, and then you can hand it over to Andy when you're done. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, thank, obviously, Whitney for the technology and allowing us to participate like this, and Christine Ross, who's your outstanding president of the chamber and a member of my business advisory council. So uh, I appreciate that a lot and for allowing me to take part in this. And I really want to reach out to everybody who's on this uh, program. I'll give you my cell phone at the end of my presentation so you can always contact me uh, with any specific concerns uh, and I'll do my best to try to uh, keep you up to date on what exactly is going on either in our agency or in other parts of state government. Um, these are extraordinary times and I just wanna thank each of you for being uh, compassionate and generous and understanding and uh, intelligent as far as how to deal with this health crisis and the economic consequences which are the aftermath. I personally appreciate what I hear all over the state which is let's be smart, let's be intelligent, let's make sure people are protected, but let's make sure the economy uh, to the extent we can is reconstructed uh, in a positive way. So my thanks most of all to you but also to the people in the state who never really get represented. Uh, they're faced with all sorts of conflicting information from politicians like me uh, all over the country. It's just a complete confused uh, cacophony of advice coming, a lot of it contradicting each other and a lot of it being seemingly arbitrary. So on behalf of all the state governments uh, in the country and the federal government and even our wonderful state government here in Maryland, you have my apologies, but I think you understand 
that this is something which is just completely off the charts as far as uh, anything that we've experienced before. I assume the Board of Public Works that I'm a member of will be heavily involved uh, in the short-term budget uh, actions that need to be taken to ensure the financial stability for the state uh, in the remaining part of this fiscal year until June 30th. And I think after that, in the next fiscal year, starting July 1st, there are going to be some short-term and long-term uh, adjustments. I'm very pleased that Andy Schaffel is with us. He is our immensely talented Director of Revenue Estimates. He's on this call. I also have my indispensable Chief of Staff, one of the great public servants uh, in the state of Maryland, Len Foxwell, who is with us, I believe, and is available for uh, questions uh, in addition to Mr. Schaffel. And then Alex, uh, our wonderful new acquisition from Johns Hopkins, recent graduate who helped organize this. Uh, we're all available for uh, helping you. The revenue projections that Mr. Schaffel and his team produced uh, recently are a snapshot, frankly, of what can only be described as an economic nightmare for our great state, for our citizens, and for our businesses. I can't empathize enough with not just small businesses, but every business that's facing this brave new world. The revenue figures, uh, along with the number of unemployed Marylanders, which uh, apparently is approaching 500,000 within a very short period of time, and businesses that are on the verge of closing their doors permanently, the, the, the scope and magnitude is simply unprecedented. We uh, used, and Andy will describe this in more detail, two economic scenarios that Mo Moody's Analytics has come up with to provide revenue projections. Projecting revenues during this rapidly evolving public health and economic situation, as you can imagine, is like predicting the weather during a tornado and a hurricane that are happening at the same time. But we have two scenarios. Scenario two is the optimistic scenario, which would result in a $925 million reduction in the next month and a half to the fiscal year 2020 budget, $2 billion in the fiscal 2021 budget, and $2.6 billion in the fiscal year 2022. Scenario four, as opposed to two, scenario four is the worst case scenario pessimistic one, which would result in a $1.1 billion reduction in fiscal year 2020, $2.6 billion in 2021, $4 billion in fiscal year 2022. The two scenarios assume several factors that in many cases, frankly, are beyond our control. The optimistic scenario assumes that Congress will provide financial assistance to states like Maryland and local governments like our counties and that additional stimulus packages will be approved to assist smuggling, uh, uh, struggling Americans, <laughs> small businesses, and corporations. That, frankly, is a very uh, optimistic outlook, given the deep partisan divide, which we know, <clears throat> unfortunately, has paralyzed Washington. What's very clear is that we could end up, frankly, much worse in either the optimistic or the pessimistic scenario because both of them assume two things, that A, in 2021 calendar year, we have a vaccine that works and a vaccine that is widely distributed. That's number one. And secondly, uh, that we are not going to experience by premature, uh, non-smart, uh, kind of uh, cavalier, rush to reopen the economy in different parts of the state, in different parts of the country, that result in a spike uh, and a resurgence of this mysterious virus that we still don't uh, completely understand. So those two assumptions, uh, I've got my fingers crossed, uh, the vaccine is with us sooner rather than later, and that there isn't any further spike in infections and uh, deaths that occur from a um, too aggressive reopening. So as comptroller, I've always warned against massive spending uh, increases. I've always urged fiscal caution and I advocate for saving as much money as possible. We're not like Washington, obviously in Maryland, we have to uh, balance our budget. We can't just borrow and borrow and accrue unsustainable deficits that we pass along to future generations. That's not what we do. Uh, we we frankly have to be fiscally responsible in order to be socially responsible in Maryland. 
But as we enter this era of economic devastation, and I mentioned the amount of uh, unemployment, uh, it's I don't want to sugarcoat things. There are tens of thousands of small businesses in Maryland that are laid off their employees and are never going to reopen. That's a tragedy that every single one of them represents a little ecosystem of economic activity that we're going to miss. But we need to emphasize that now of all times is the worst time under the worst possible circumstances to enter into massive new spending projects and take more money out of consumers' pockets in a time when hundreds of thousands of our fellow Marylanders are experiencing job loss, potential job loss, reduction in income, et cetera. So it's a long-winded way of saying we're going to eventually overcome the public health crisis. We're going to restore the confidence of the consumers, but they need to have something in their pockets to spend in order for a recovery to occur. The best minds in science and medicine are working on vaccines. Uh, policymakers are going to find a way to avoid another closure of the economy, I'm sure, because it's just too uh, draconian in its impact. And uh, I believe the health and safety of our citizens is going to be safeguarded. But I would like to uh, hear from folks as to how we can win the recovery. Uh, I happen to think we need to, starting now, subject every new policy initiative at the state and local level to a three-point test. Number one, will it put more money in the pockets of Marylanders or will it take more money out? And I'm including small businesses there. Number two, will it make Maryland small businesses better positioned or less positioned to compete, success, and survive with the other states uh, in the new economy? And then finally, number three, will a given policy make Maryland a more attractive place to live, invest, and retire? And let me emphasize retire because we're regarded as a state that's not friendly to seniors and folks that want to retire in our great state. So everything we uh, do moving forward, I believe, must be addressed through these three fundamental questions. And um, obviously, everything has changed. Uh, it's not as if we have any discretion. But for example, uh, people are talking about the K through 12 school program starting up in September. The kids are not going to go back to school assemblies. They're not going to go back to crowded cafeterias eating their lunch. They're not going to go back to crowded classrooms. They're not going to get to uh, school on crowded school buses. All of that's going to change. It has to change because of this pandemic. And obviously, we're going to see changes in transportation policy and healthcare policy. Long-winded way of saying again, everything's going to change. We must adapt. Uh, those of us, us in political office really need to get rid of some of the legacy of mythologies that we've had that uh, business as usual is okay. We're all going to have to pull together uh, from the governor, legislators, local leaders, nonprofit organizations, advocacy, advocacy groups, most importantly, the business community, and work together to win the recovery. So let me uh, ask Mr. Schaffel to make his presentation, and then we're happy to take uh, any questions that you folks have. And let me just give my uh, cell phone number to you, everybody, 301 area code. 332-1961. I probably will not answer if you call, but I will get the message or I will get the text. And if I can be helpful, uh, I will get back to you. Uh, if I can't be, I'll try to let you know that also. But thank you guys for participating today. I look forward to your uh, information and data and questions. Mr. Schaffel is a Another indispensable part of the Maryland bureaucracy. It's a very, very expert economist. And uh, Andy, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Comptroller. Whitney, you're going to drive the slides, right? I think that's. Yes, sir. That's, that's correct. Going to work. Great. I think the Comptroller did a great job of uh, introducing uh, me as well as the broad outlines of what we're going to discuss here. Um, obviously, you know, kicking off this presentation, uh, the first thing you have to do is talk about uncertainty. You all are facing it as business leaders, um, and we know uncertainty is not good for the economy. But simply from a fiscal planning standpoint, 
uh, I assume you all have scenarios outlined in your uh, for your businesses as well, but but just approaching them with the real level of uh, seriousness that they should get uh, is important. I was reading uh, this morning uh, Peggy Noonan, one of my favorite uh, 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 commentaries uh, in the Wall Street Journal today. She said, "Life is a messy thing that doesn't want to be quantified." And I just think that is such a such a such a great reminder of, of where we are right now. Uh, we have some things that we know, and we feel like we finally can wrap our arms around the near term of what we're facing. Uh, but three months out, things get quite uncertain. Uh, six months out, they get even more so. And once we start talking about a year, uh, I think the range of possibilities is, is extraordinary. Uh, wider than anything I've ever seen. Uh, and I came into this uh, line of business uh, in the depths of the Great Recession. So, you know, the talk back then was uncertainty. Uh, the Great Recession pales in terms of in terms of that. And the reason is that this is not a regular business cycle recession, right? This is not a recession caused by the financial markets. Um, this is completely outside of the realm of human behavior and economics, and it's being uh, forced upon us. Of course, now it's gonna ripple through the real and financial economies, and that's what we're trying to get a hold of. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, and we'll start talking about the numbers that we see so far. Uh, as the Comptroller noted, we have run two scenarios, uh, and we regard uh, the area between these two as the likely outcomes at this point. Uh, this is the general fund, um, which is the majority of the state spending and uh, represents uh, the spending on the types of items that we most often associate uh, with state and local government, uh, being education and healthcare is where the majority of these dollars go. Um, so you can see in fiscal 20, we have a band of between 925 million and 1.1 billion. Uh, to put that in terms, that's between five and six percent of the entire annual uh, estimate. And then in fiscal 21, we widen out there to between two and 2.6 billion. And then out to fiscal 22, uh, 2.6 billion to four. We're talking upwards of uh, possibly 20 percent relative to prior expectations. So we're talking about an extraordinary correction. Um, just to come back to some of the mechanics here, uh, we are using Moody's Analytics. Uh, Mark Zandi is, uh, is someone I have a personal connection with, I have a great deal of respect for. Um, they are, they, they, they employed uh, a handful of epidemiologists in early March and have used those epidemiologists and their scientific models to amend their economic models. Um, so, you know, there's no perfect science for that. We're talking about two relationships that, that there is really no data for, uh, but they're making some very good uh, use of their expert knowledge to weave those two modeling techniques together uh, to produce what we feel are the best scenarios at this point. Uh, it's worth noting that we didn't take Moody's baseline. These are their forecasts from April. Uh, Moody's baseline we thought was too optimistic at the time, and so far we've been proven correctly. Uh, the jobs impact in Moody's baseline has already been blown out of the water. Moody's will rebase uh, later this month, and we think it'll look much closer to S2, if not somewhere between S2 and the S4 that we have here. The Comptroller mentioned the keys. Uh, S2 uh, uh, assumes, uh, they both assume that we have a vaccine that's widely distributed by late next year. Uh, but S2 assumes that we get further uh, stimulus from the federal government. S4 assumes that we do not, or that what we get is significantly insufficient. Um, clearly, that's the language that's going on right now. I won't pretend to have my uh, the pulse of Capitol Hill. I am optimistic that that's a lot of negotiating bluster, but this is a presidential election year. And uh, I think some of those items can be thrown out the window, and, and that does put this money at a real, uh, at a heightened level of uncertainty uh, relative to any other year. Um, the other assumptions vary 
between how deep the downturn is, how significant the job losses are and whatnot. Um, so let me kind of jump in so I can start to illustrate that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Here is the number of unemployment claims. These are initial claims, not ongoing claims. This chart just shows, uh, it offers the clearest picture I've been able to find of how rapid the onset has been to the labor market. Nothing matters more to the macroeconomic situation than the number of individuals employed. And here we have 500,000 Marylanders through eight weeks. It took a year and a half in the Great Recession to reach that number. It took a year and a half in the early 1990s. Uh, it's worth noting that the early 90s recession was a recession that was particularly acute to the state of Maryland uh, because it also included the peace dividend. So uh, on top of the, the business cycle uh, that was taking place, we were also reducing government expenditures during that time. So that was a uh, horrific recession for Maryland relative to the nation as a whole. Um, but the numbers here are staggering. We know that they're understated. And it's also worth pointing out that these numbers do not include uh, the addition of independent contractors that are allowed to claim unemployment during this uh, pandemic. So, uh, you know, this is this is somewhat an apples to apples comparison other than the, uh, the backlog that exists currently. Excuse me, moving on to the next slide. What has been surprising to us, and this is noisy and I won't dwell on this, is how well our wage growth has held up to this point. Uh, when we initially took a look at this, I was forecasting that we would see uh, a 22% drop in wages almost immediately. How could we put 500,000 Marylanders on the unemployment rolls, uh, also have furloughs, also, almost cease hiring entirely and have wage growth. We've spent the majority of the past three weeks trying to figure that out. And uh, there is no, no silver bullet that, uh, that explains it to us. Uh, but as we look into the companies and the timing, uh, we do start to pick up on a few things. Uh, one is that it seems natural that my wage assumptions were a bit too aggressive. Um, one, uh, you know, from the, uh, the day and hour is worked, uh, there could be several weeks until those hours are paid. And then of course it gets to the state's coffers for withholding. So there's a natural delay there to begin with. But additionally, uh, you know, as you all are making your employment decisions, uh, you know, back in early March, things looked very different and you were making decisions about employment that were probably going to be in effect two or three weeks out. So it was also based on employers' perceptions, which adds even more distance to that lag, lag of time. So I think, uh, I think the lag there is certainly greater than I was anticipating it initially. Uh, but further, 4% um, of our employers account for 80% of our withholding. Some of that is our government presence and our, our, our uh, reliance on higher education, uh, as well as healthcare, which tend to be uh, big player dominated industries. Um, and we generally accounted for a lot of that in our initial thoughts. Uh, but nonetheless, big employers play an outsized role. And we know that balance sheets were quite strong headed into this. Uh, companies were holding back on investment to some degree. I've always put a lot of that on the demographics and expectations of lower demand because of, of the, uh, 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 the, the older aging population. Uh, but in addition, we had very low interest rates. And if you were a high quality borrower, you were able to borrow, at a, at borrow money at a pretty cheap rate. So uh, balance sheets were very strong uh, heading into this. And you combine that with the fact that employers tend to be compassionate people. I've never met an employer uh, that didn't feel responsible for their employees. And I don't think there's a snap judgment to move to layoffs. I think uh, other types of line items are viewed uh, generally before labor. So I think there's a bit of stickiness there. I think that stickiness is magnified also because of the past uh, 10 years where we talked endlessly about the skills gap. So employers have made significant investments in their employees, and uh, I think they're rather tethered to those employees and don't want to uh, simply cut them loose and, uh, and lose those investments that they've made. 
So the ability to weather is critical. Further, you have government programs, the PPP loan program, our comptroller's uh, forbearance for sales tax and withholding. Um, you know, sales tax, I think we have delayed about uh, close to about $100 million in sales tax at this point, which if you look at average wages, is enough to keep anywhere between uh, 20,000 to 35,000 Marylanders on the payroll for a month. Perhaps that was that bridge that helped employers get to the PPP. So I think it's a combination of a lot of these factors. There's some creativity going on out there, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, but, but I do believe that the pain is coming. Um, you can see the trend line here is turning down, and uh, I do expect that to continue. I do expect we'll see about negative three to negative 6% wage growth the rest of this fiscal year, and it's going to hit double digits it's almost certainly going to hit double digits. Um, and those wages are critical to our revenues and they're critical to the demand side of the economy, right? So that's when we're really gonna start to see uh, 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 the demand side impacts really kick off uh, in, the, in the pending recession. Uh, next slide, please. Here are Moody's forecasts of U.S. nominal GDP, uh, S2 and S4. Uh, I took the chart all the way back so you could see uh, the Great Recession there. And you'll notice that the Great Recession is about half of the uh, S2 magnitude and a third of S4. To repeat that, the Great Recession, which is capitalized, capital G, capital R, because it's supposed to be a once in a lifetime occurrence is forecast to be doubled, if not tripled, in terms of magnitude here. You can also see here the different timelines and the different uh, manners in which uh, these play out. And I'll get into a little more detail there on, uh, on, this, on the, the next several slides. Um, but, but we're talking about uh, a once in a lifetime downturn, which I know is what we said in the Great Recession. Uh, here, let's hope that it's certainly true this time. Next slide. To illustrate uh, how Maryland's look in the uh, Moody's forecast compares to those national numbers, as you'd expect, we have uh, less of a contraction, although still significant and deeper than the Great Recession, and then a slower pace of recovery and then a slower expansion once it turns into an expansion. This is Maryland's MO. Uh, it's, our, it's our federal government uh, and its importance to the economy uh, in play here. We never expand as fast. We never fall as far. Um, we see less of the bubble. I personally appreciate uh, the, 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 the lack of volatility or the reduced volatility, rather. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing from certainly makes my job a little bit easier, uh, but, but it tends to be a, a good thing. One thing to note when you're looking back at the Great Recession and you're thinking about how Maryland got through that, you can't forget that that was also a time where the Obama administration was expanding government employment in Maryland generally, but also that was in the middle of BRAC. At that exact time period, we were bringing in thousands of high paying jobs, uh, both direct government as well as uh, contractor jobs. So, um, you know, we really, didn't look like we saw a lot of pain when you look at the numbers back into the Great Recession. Uh, but we don't have those sorts of occurrences now, and we certainly don't have an administration in D.C. that uh, is going to start uh, federal hiring in, in a major way. Next slide, please. This is the uh, uh, exact same chart as the prior, but it's S4, so it's the deeper impact here with the more prolonged recession and uh, prolonged recovery. Um, I'll we'll obviously make these charts available to you. Uh, let me move on to the next one so we can compare and contrast the two. Here are the Maryland GDP versions uh, for the S2 and S4. These are indexed to Q4. I, I love this look. This helps me understand the depth of the downturn. Uh, it puts the two on equal footing, so you can really compare them quite easily. Uh, you can see that in S2, we've reached a trough of recession where we've lost 8% of our economic value uh, in this current quarter, right? And that makes some sense. 
Um, the question is, what is the snapback? You see a slight snapback in Q3 as we bring more folks back onto payroll and the, uh, the stay-at-home restrictions are eased. Um, and then the broader recession uh, continues and the pace of recovery. S4, you get the slight bounce back in Q3, but then you have a prolonged downturn. You don't reach a recessionary trowel of almost 12% until uh, a year from now. A full year from this quarter is where you reach your trowel, and then you begin to grow in the third quarter of 2021. Um, everybody's talking about shapes right now. The blue line is close to a U. Uh, you could certainly say it's a W because of that one quarter uh, uptick there in Q3. Uh, the orange is a swoosh. I don't like to advertise Nike. I'm a local uh, Under Armour guy. Got my golf shirt on now. I'm going golfing with my seven-year-old later this afternoon. I couldn't be more excited for that. Um, but you can't deny that this is that sort of a uh, slow growth swoosh uh, that you've seen. And I'll say that the blue line, uh, while certainly more aggressive than the orange, is still a very slow recovery. We're looking at uh, paces of expansion that are similar to uh, the Great Recession, which were well below every other economic expansion. Um, so, so we're talking about a pretty dismal picture here. Um, and, and of course, it's worth noting that the further we get out, the more uncertainty there is. Every recession is a correction. Um, what is retail going to look like? What is commercial real estate going to look like? right this recession is going to quicken the pace of the correction that's been underway for the last 20 years as we shift to more of the uh, technology taking a greater role in the economy brick and mortar is going to be under greater pressure there's going to be more folks working in the warehouses and in transportation office space is going to change for forever it's going to be a very interesting outcome. And of course, there's going to be opportunities. There are always benefits of corrections, but there's a lot of pain between the current and the benefits. And uh, it looks like we're going to be in for some prolonged pain and some prolonged transformation. Moving on to the next slide. What matters more to our forecast than anything, as I mentioned earlier, is employment. Here is payroll employment in the state of Maryland. Again, I have the Great Recession there. Um, over the course of two years, we lost 123,000 jobs. Uh, here, S2, our more optimistic scenario, we lose 252,000 in one quarter. Even as we get back to work in Q3, we're down 173,000 in that. So we're still almost up 50% in terms of job losses from the Great Recession. S4, down 342,000 jobs. That actually looks like the more plausible downturn right now for Q2. The snap back to 186, and then the ongoing recession. We almost get back to prior peak uh, in S2 out at the end of 2023, uh, but you can see that remains well below where the trend would have needed to be to maintain that level of employment we were accustomed to before all of this. We all know that we were employing at a higher level than the natural rate of unemployment before this. Uh, we all felt there was some sort of bubble. Nobody could really identify it. Uh, but it was a great thing, uh, the amount of employment we had in this economy prior to this incident. And uh, it is what we should be striving to get back to. Uh, so getting back to that red line is uh, that hash line is really what we need to do to get back to a world that resembles uh, 2019 Q4, which for all, all purposes was a was a pretty good world, uh, certainly from an economic standpoint. <laughs> Moving on to the next slide. Uh, for those that have any interest in this sort of thing, here's our breakdown by components. Uh, the income tax in Maryland is half of the general fund. So naturally, there's a, a huge impact there. Uh, withholding makes up the bulk of that with wages. But of course, we do see a prolonged and significant decline in business income. And that is factored into these, uh, these estimates. The sales tax is directly impacted. Uh, the shutdown uh, is significant. 
Uh, we do have uh, real data from that is sales tax that was collected during the month of March. Uh, we believe that to have been down. You know, we have to control for uh, the forbearance, uh, but we believe that to have been down about 30 percent in the month of March, where we were on a shut uh, stay at home order for about half. So if you double that, we're down about 60 percent on the sales tax side. Uh, do keep in mind that Maryland sales tax, as most of you probably know, does not include groceries. Uh, it does not include medicine. So uh, several of the items items that may be increasing in volume during this period, the state's not seeing any sort of revenue from that. And then we have our myriad other taxes and fees rounding out uh, the remainder. Um, the next slide shows you the S4 scenario impact. Um, and that looks uh, pretty similar, just bigger numbers. And then moving on to the next slide, here is the reality for the folks on the budget side and those that uh, relate directly to the government. That was the prior outlook for the state's general fund, and there you see the collapse in revenues. Fiscal 2022, we're back to 2015 levels, okay? So the government budget is going to be under extraordinary pressures. Uh, ideally, we get some money from the, head, the feds to help weather, uh, uh, this, but if, in that case, we're probably still looking at the blue line. So there does need to be a re-envisioning of the state's priorities. It's going to be required. Um, and then if I could, for just two seconds, I'll opine on, on where I think folks should be headed. And the reality is, as the economy, this is going to, as I said, hasten the transition uh, to the knowledge economy. And, and we really do need to focus on adult education and creating skilled workers, not just children. Obviously, we have to educate our folk, our kids to be able to succeed in today's environment. But we can't forget about the adults. And we need to be thinking about meaningful job guidance uh, that really helps folks succeed in, in the economy that is going to be there in two to three years. Uh, and I think that's going to be critically important and it also offers uh, strategic value to the state. And we could really make ourselves one of those locations where people wanna be, where businesses wanna form, where they wanna move to, uh, if we really can illustrate that investment in our folks and the value we can get out of uh, our untrained labor at this point in time. And with that, I'll, I'll stop my own commentary and uh, open it back up. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, Comptroller Andy, and also Len and Alex. Um, thank you so much for your willingness to participate with us. For those of you who are on the call um, and on our webinar, my name is Ashley Duckman. I'm our Vice President of Government Affairs at the Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to thank the Comptroller and his team again for your partnership and collaboration all the time, but obviously in particular now as we together um, navigate these very uncharted waters. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't start with that. We did in advance uh, submit to our membership and solicit them for some questions. And we did have a few roll in. We do have a hard stop at 2.30, but if I might, I wanted to get to some of these that our membership submitted in advance, um, some high level, some a little bit more specific. And I see on our attendee list that I have a lot of members of my tax committee on the call. And I think this one that came in will be of interest to them. Um, the Federal CARES Act had a considerable number of tax implications contained within it for states, in particular things like suspending the 80% taxable income limitation, allowing for five-year carryback for net operating losses, um, and, you know, we know that rolling conformity states that have not yet not expressly decoupled from IRC Section 187 are likely to conform to the new carryback provisions absent a legislative change. And my members are wondering if you can speak broadly to some of the other changes laid out in the CARES Act and how they are being applied or viewed in Maryland. And then I've gotten a number of specific questions. This appeared multiple times asking if Maryland plans to decouple from parts of the Federal CARES Act, um, in particular questions about QIP and NOL. Could I ask my chief of staff to uh, pick up the microphone and respond to that? Because, uh, you know, I, there was a long list of uh, issues there. and Maybe we should deal with that a little bit in a special question and answer seminar with our tax experts. 
But yeah, and I'll, and I not to not to, and not to hit the beach ball around the bleachers, but if there are any elements of the uh, roster of questions that Mr. Schaff would like to speak to, I'll hand the microphone, if you will, over to him. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, you know, Maryland is unique in that. Uh, you know, with regard to decoupling. We have a law in place that uh, if our office estimates that any one of the provisions has an impact of greater than five million in the current year in which the bill was passed, we auto decouple uh, from that provision for that year. And then it's up to the General Assembly to decide whether or not to couple or not. Uh, we haven't gotten that far in the analysis. Um, we'll be working on that. I know our attorneys are, 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 are working that out. Um, I can tell you with almost certainty that the NOL uh, impact is greater than five million in the current year. Uh, so I'd be surprised if there isn't an auto decouple on that initial provision. Um, but I encourage you to wait for the official guidance that'll be coming out of our office. We're required to issue a report within 60 days of the bill passing, um, and and I know that they are they are working towards that. The tax professionals. Thanks very much. And, and Comptroller, to your point, I think certainly a, a large segment of my members would be very interested in having a, a tax specific conversation as we move into future phases of recovery. So we look forward to, to partnering with you on that. Um, another question we got a lot of, and I'm paraphrasing, is um, in the event of a worst case scenario, as you've outlined here, with potentially no support in the form of direct federal aid, is there any way you could provide us with some context about early discussions that are being had as to how this how the state might make attempt to make up for that loss in revenue, either from a tax policy perspective or, or, or a more aggregate way? So what's already on the table? Are there initial discussions happening? Um, there's a lot of a lot of interest in that from among the membership. Okay. First of all, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it's all up in the air because I don't think certain parts of the Maryland uh, power structure, so to speak, in Annapolis has really focused on what the economic consequences are here. So first of all, any talk of tax increases has to be put aside. It's just completely inappropriate as far as timing and uh, also just rationale. Uh, and that's under the first item that I talked about, which is consumers need to keep cash in their pockets. Small businesses need to keep cash in their pockets. Uh, both for employment and economic activity reasons. Uh, that's why we had a tax uh, tax holiday in effect for 90 days. That's basically a tax-free loan from the state of Maryland to small businesses and, and uh, Maryland families. That's, you know, that the logic there is let's keep money in people's pockets until we actually have to take it under existing law. And uh, so I, first and foremost, as far as what people are talking about or are going to be uh, arriving at is uh, no new fee or tax increases unless there's some unbelievably urgent need um, that is specific to a, to, a, to a question. And that's a big change from the normal uh, perspective of a lot of the major county in uh, Maryland and also uh, the General Assembly. But I'm not the governor. That's uh, up to Governor Hogan. He He's more or less in charge for the next several years. But I would be stunned if uh, the state went back to its, uh, if it moves, let's tax it and spend it on something that has a nice name. Thank you very much. Um, sort of pivoting and, and building upon that, I mean, based on the fact that we, some parts of the state are moving into phase one of reopening today, allowing some businesses to come back online, but not all. Other parts of the state are taking a, a longer term approach and still have not given a date certain as to when that might occur. Um, is your office considering extending any of those tax, quote, tax holidays or any other policy changes that will help with that cash flow situation in the near term. And then another question that I've gotten a lot of is, are there any things being considered to help spur economic activity in the longer term? The answer is yes to both of those, because frankly, I'm more concerned about the budgets of folks that are on this call 
and their companies, their families, their employees, uh, frankly, than I am of the state of Maryland and the counties and the municipalities. As important as those public budgets are, right now, uh, the major hemorrhaging is, is occurring from the private sector budgets that are uh, just beyond belief damage. So, Andy, do you want to mention anything there or Len? Uh, but the answer to both of those questions is yes. Mr. Comptroll, I wouldn't mind jumping in here for a second, and I'm going to speak for the next couple of minutes uh, as the, on behalf of the Alcohol Regulatory Agency in the state. And as many of you know, if you're in the hospitality sector, we have taken some steps both as an agency and by working in collaboration with Governor Hogan and his administration to help our restaurants, bars, taverns, and craft manufacturers weather this unprecedented storm. First thing uh, the comptroller directed us to do was eliminate a rather archaic provision of alcohol trade law that limited uh, Maryland breweries to um, 288 ounces in the volume that they can sell to their customers for off-premise consumption. In other words, I go into a craft brewery uh, and I want to take something home, I can only sell, I can only take home 288 ounces, which is the metric equivalent of one case. Uh, it's no sensible reason other than to restrict the growth of our craft sector. Uh, the other thing that we did by working with the governor and his administration was allow our um, on-premise retailers or restaurants, bars, and taverns to directly deliver alcohol beverages along with along with meals to the customer's doorstep and that's a change in trade policy not just bottled and canned um, products but also mixed drinks and moving forward we have seen that uh, we'll have to look at the data but anecdotally we've been able to uh, facilitate this transition without any real problems in terms of underage consumption or lack of licensure or anything, um, uh, lack of diligence and you know, requesting IDs from customers. And as we transition to the new normal and uh, restaurant, the hospitality sector is going to be dealing with continued concerns about the health and safety of going out for on-premise dining and as we have to continue to embrace social distancing measures and limited crowds for the foreseeable future, we're thinking quite hard about how to memorialize these temporary provisions as permanent law. And I would say that the three things that we're really looking at is um, permanent direct, sh direct shipment of alcohol beverages, for, of beer just like we now do with wine, uh, continued direct delivery of alcohol beverages to the door from the retailer and also uh, allowing uh, beer and wine to be sold uh, throughout the state in grocery stores. And I think many of you would agree that that is a change of statute that is long overdue and it's being done in many other states throughout the union. So sorry to get specific, but those are three things right off the bat that we can do to help a hospitality sector that now employs 458,000 people and is really struggling to survive in the aftermath of this pandemic. Let me thank you, Len, for that. That's an excellent description of one small example of a sector that needs to be changed as far as its regulatory uh, and economic impact. Every sector is going to have to be looked at through that lens. I can personally attest over the last month to having bought a large number of bottled margaritas and martinis for my own personal use here in Tacoma Park. Uh, and how appreciative the restaurants are of being able to sell me a $14 drink that they have a significant margin of profit uh, from. And, you know, how it's tidied over quite a few that still are severely hampered by the restrictions. But uh, what Len is talking about, I think, is just a template for almost every uh, operation that we're regulating and overseeing here in the state of Maryland. Everything needs to be modernized. 
Thank you, Comptroller. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the nod to margaritas. It is Friday afternoon, so I don't want to keep you or our attendees too long. I think we have time for just one more question um, and I'll ask it and then we can all uh, have a great weekend. This one has to do with support from Congress. We had a touched on it in your remarks and in Andy's, uh, the idea that there might be the potential for direct federal aid to backfill or uh, uh, augment some of these revenue shortcomings. Are there specific things that your office is looking for in that next federal stimulus package, provided it is able to take off? I mean, we know that the HEROES Act is out there, it doesn't seem to have any legs uh, in the Senate, but didn't know if your office was talking about or thinking about specific things that the federal government, the Congress could or should be doing um, that the business community might also support. Well, I'm going to defer to uh, Senator Cardin and Senator Van Hollen and the uh, Congress people that are dealing with this uh, situation. But I would hope at an absolute minimum that the law that is applied to the monies we've received already for COVID uh, treatment and prevention would be uh, uh, made more flexible so that what monies we've received can be spent uh, much more liberally as far as easing some of the uh, gaps in the state budget that exists right now. Ideally, uh, we would recognize that states like Maryland are well run fiscally uh, and it's no fault of ours that we're facing uh, major gaps, nor is it most for most other states with maybe some small exceptions. So I hope Congress will enact the $500 billion proposal. Uh, it's unclear whether uh, that's even in the cards. I always keep my fingers crossed. Uh, Andy or Len, do you have any special insight? I mean, I think you're you're right. There's opportunity with the money that's already out there. The bill was very specific. It could only be used for coronavirus-related expenditures, and of course, we can be liberal about that. And we are, um, but the you know they did the right thing and they got money out quickly before giving it too much thought. But also, what that means is. Uh, it wasn't like the money was given to states that had greater concentrations of the virus. So some states, uh, you know, like a, like a New Hampshire that has not seen an extraordinary outbreak, got a similar per capita to what Maryland got or what New York got. So there is likely to be some money left around to where if they were to uh, ease those restrictions, that could go a long way. Uh, somewhere in there is the sweet spot where they can help states not be uh, overly, uh, you know, piling on to the job losses. And, and that's really the key. And it's not just about Maryland. Uh, it's about the national uh, because because as goes the nation, as goes Maryland. And if we if we de if we if we turn this into a much deeper recession, um, we're going to regret it later. We really, really are, um, you know. We should have been watching the deficit eight years ago, not today. Now's when you print the money. Now's when you spend that money. Um, and then we're going to have to deal with it. But but I think uh, it has to go in, in that order. Let's deal with it. Let's get it out there. And then let's deal with it. Len, do you want to add anything in conclusion? I think we're wrapping up here. But I'm happy to stay on, Ashley, for a minute or more. Uh, so more if you want. No, I'm fine, Mr. Carilla. Thanks for the chance. Okay. Well, listen, Ashley, thank you. And thank your whole organization. Seriously, everybody who's on the call right now should just go take a look in the mirror and give yourself a pat on the back. It is just unbelievable what we're collectively experiencing here and uh, look forward to working with everyone and having a very positive reconstruction of the state's economy as we move forward. Thank you so much, Comptroller. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Len, and to all of our attendees. Have a great weekend. Uh, be safe and well. Again, this will be recorded and the slides will be available on our website following the conclusion of our webinar. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Be well.